All right, thank Jeff. you, Roger. Yes. And thank you, Bob DeLong, for arranging this. And thank all of you for coming. It is my uh, great pleasure to be among you this evening and to have the privilege of addressing you. I trust everyone can hear me. I ordinarily have a strong voice. I very rarely use a mic. But I'm, I'm using one tonight because I've had some uh, little issue with my vocal cords lately, as you can tell. But anyway, if you have a hard time hearing me, let, let me know. We'll do something about it. OK. Albert Einstein once said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is the fact that it is comprehensible. In the same vein, I say to you that the most incomprehensible thing about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is the fact that it is comprehensible. With uh, three tools, keys as it were, we will open all doors, or nearly all. They are evidence, eyewitness, material and circumstantial, reason, and an understanding of human nature. Think of the matter globally. What really happened on the night of April 14th, 1865? The president was assassinated, of course, as we all know. But uh, what else happened on the same night? The vice president, Andrew Johnson, was also targeted for assassination. But his would-be assassins, George Atzerodt and uh, David Harold, encountered a problem at the uh, Kirkwood House where Johnson was staying, uh, the precise nature of which we do not know. Most likely, Johnson had security posted at or about his door, or perhaps he was hungover or sleeping or otherwise engaged in his suite and therefore unresponsive to knocking, which is what Leonard Farwell found. Farwell was a former governor of Wisconsin. who just happened to be at Ford's Theater that night. It is what he found when he made a beeline from Ford's to the Kirkwood to apprise Johnson of what had happened at Ford's. He knocked and knocked and knocked and got no response. So he knocked and knocked and knocked some more, got no response. This is all in the trial transcript, incidentally. And finally, in desperation, he said, Governor Johnson, Governor Johnson, I must, uh, if you are in your room, I must see you. Finally, finally, Johnson came to the door. All we're certain of is that Atzerodt put his head into the lion's mouth, which is to say he entered the Kirkwood house at killing time between 10 and 10.30 p.m. and then left within five minutes according to John Fletcher, the stableman with whom he had just had a drink at the Union Hotel and whose suspicions were aroused because of certain indiscretions that Atzerodt uh, had made. Atzerodt returned his horse uh, to the stable, ran around the city like a crazy man for a couple of hours, got drunk, threw his knife away, Caught a few hours uh, sleep at the Pennsylvania house, a cheap Washington hotel, pawned his revolver, and then left town, heading for a cousin's farm near Baltimore, rather than a rendezvous with Booth and Harold, which was the original plan, according to Richard Smoot, who was on the edges of the conspiracy and who wrote about it 35 years later in 1900 when it was safe to do so. Atzerodt was never very reliable, and uh, no one knew it better than Booth, which is why he double teamed him with that fellow, David Harold. What else happened? That fellow, Lewis Powell, Elias Payne, Mosby, the Reverend Wood, and many other aliases came within an inch of assassinating the Secretary of State. William Seward, there is Seward before the attack, and there is Seward after the attack. The Secretary of State? Why would anyone want to assassinate the Secretary of State? What else? What else happened? 
there is good persuasive evidence, strong evidence, that an attempt was made on the life of that man, Edwin Stanton, who was the Secretary of War. The previous evening, a man came to the Stanton mansion. The Stantons were entertaining the Grants that night, Ulysses and Julia. The man uh, had dark clothing. He uh, wore a slouch hat. He claimed to be a lawyer to have information for the secretary, information in pa papers. And he stayed outside for a while, but then he went inside. He took position on one side of the hallway and appeared to be casing out the premises. He made inquiries about Stanton and Grant, who were in the parlor. And when he uh, uh, attempted to gain access to them in the parlor, he was stopped uh, and asked to leave by one John C. Hatter. Uh, at the trial of the conspirators in May and June of 65, David Stanton, the secretary's nephew, Hatter, and another man identified that intruder as that fellow, Michael O'Loughlin, a co-conspirator. On the following night, that is to say the night of the assassination, the 14th, a man was seen wearing a tall hat and muffled in a cloak, a cloak, seen skulking on Stanton's porch. He left abruptly upon the approach of messengers variously described coming from Ford's theater to apprise the secretary of what had happened at Ford's. Another man was seen hiding behind a tree box on Stanton's property. He ran away when an attempt was made to apprehend him. Stanton credited a broken doorbell with saving his life. The attempt on Stanton receives corroboration from the response of Jefferson Davis when he learned of the assassination of Lincoln four days after it occurred. He said, quote, if the same had been done to Secretary Stanton, the job would be complete. It is also corroborated by the fact that Stanton is mentioned as an intended victim in conversations between Confederate Secret Service operatives in Canada. And it is also corroborated by Thomas A. Jones, the self-described head of the Confederate Secret Service in Maryland, who wrote about it in 1893 when it was safe to do so, stating categorically that Stanton was an intended victim. What else happened? <clears throat> A man attempted to gain access to Grant's private car on the train to Burlington, New Jersey that night from Washington, near the Harvard Grace Station where the train pauses before it crosses the Susquehanna River. He was stopped by an alert brakeman and a locked car door. A day or two later, Grant received an anonymous letter, the writer stating that he was that man, that he fully intended to assassinate Grant, and that he thanked God that he had not been successful. The incident is mentioned in virtually every biography of Grant. <clears throat> it was also mentioned by Grant in a conversation he had with that man, Ward Hill Lehman, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who was Lincoln's uh, best friend and self-appointed bodyguard in 1880. It was also mentioned by Grant's wife, Julia, in her memoirs. The attempt on Grant receives corroboration from a statement made by Atzerat to one of his hosts, whose name was Hezekiah Metz, in response, in response to a query uh, by Metz as to whether there was anything to the rumor that Grant had also been assassinated. Atzerat, who was nothing if not indiscreet, said, quote, well, if the man who was to follow him followed him, that is likely to be true. It was this remark incidentally, that led to Atzerat's arrest and trial and conviction and execution. It is also corroborated the attempt on Grant is the fact, by the fact that Grant is mentioned as an intended victim in conversations between Confederate Secret Service operatives in Canada and also by Booth himself and also by that man, 
Another conspirator, a co-conspirator, whose name was Sam Arnold. What else? Attempts may have been made on the lives of Secretary of the Treasury, later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Salmon P. Chase, Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, Attorney General James Speed, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, General William Tecumseh Sherman, Secretary of the Interior, John P. Usher, and even others. But the evidence for these is weak. So what is going on here? Clearly much more than personal hatred of one man by another. <clears throat> that is to say, of Lincoln by Booth, which is the reason usually given for the assassination, the conventional wisdom that has, uh, 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 of the rogue operation myth that has persisted into our own time. If Booth hated Lincoln, and he undoubtedly did, why did he feel it necessary to also assassinate Johnson, Seward, Stanton, Grant, and perhaps others? Clearly what was really going on here was an attempt to decapitate the United States government for the purpose of creating chaos in that government. But how exactly was the chaos to be created? I submit to you that the answer to that question which is to say the method to Booth's madness was the presidential su succession statute of 1792, which was in effect at the time, and which provided that in the event of a simultaneous vacancy in the offices of president and vice president, the president pro tem par of the Senate would act as an interim president until such time as the Electoral College would elect a new president, a process to be put in motion by the Secretary of State. And with the Secretary of State also dead, there would be such terrible infighting in the Congress for the selection of a new Secretary of State and control of the Electoral College that the wheels of government would grind to a halt. And with the Secretary of War and the Lieutenant General of the Armies, General Grant, also dead, the wheels of the military would also grind to a halt. In this connection, consider the testimony of one Charles Dunham, uh, uh, otherwise known as Sanford Conover, an alias, and, and 20 other aliases. Uh, he's one of the most extraordinary characters in history, given at the trial of the conspirators in May and June of 65, namely that Jacob Thompson, that fellow, the major figure in the Confederate Secret Service's Canadian contingency, which was known informally as the Canadian Cabinet, said that the goal of the conspiracy was to, quote, leave the government entirely without a head, unquote, by murdering not only Lincoln, but also Vice President uh, Johnson, Secretary of State Seward, Secretary of War Stanton, Chief Justice um, uh, Sam and P. Chase, and General Grant. A question arises, a question arises as to why, if this theory is accurate, why was the president pro tempore of the Senate also not targeted for assassination? He was Lafayette S. Foster, that man, a 58-year-old Republican from Connecticut. To begin, we, we don't know with certainty that he wasn't targeted. It is certainly possible that he was, uh, that an attempt was made on his life, and that it failed, as it did in every other case that night, except the one on Lincoln, and therefore went unrecorded. Second, if he were not targeted, it was most likely because not being a member of Lincoln's inner circle, an attempt on his life would have been a clear indication, if not proof positive, of the real purpose of the conspiracy and therefore the hand of Richmond behind it. Now, let us ask ourselves, is it reasonable that this super Herculean deed of assassinating 
the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, and the Lieutenant General of the Armies, arguably the five most important people in the United States at that time, and uh, at more or less the same time, on the same night, in the same city, was conceived in the brain of, and only in the brain of, a 26-year-old actor who, as far as we know, never before had killed anyone in his life. And further, that all of the con conception and planning for this monumental undertaking uh, took place on the day, indeed the night, of the assassination and attempted assassinations at the Herndon House meeting between uh, Booth, Powell, Atzerodt, and Harold, and maybe John Surratt, about whom more later, and further that this 26-year-old actor, unschooled in the law, would know of even the existence of the 1792 Succession uh, Act of Succession. <clears throat> are we adults who know how the world works, or are we children? I submit that this is not a reasonable conclusion. I submit further that in the entire history of the United States, no assassin or would-be assassin of a president ever attempted, while he or she attempted to kill the president, to kill anyone besides the president, except Booth, who not only attempted to kill more, but four more. At least that fact alone without more being said, fairly demands the conclusion that there was much more involved in the events of April 14th, 1865 than personal hatred of one man by another. It fairly demands the conclusion rather that the events of April 14th were actuated by uh, a, a design of momentous political and military proportions. It demands a conclusion further that the design could not have been conceived in the mind of, and only in the mind of, a 26-year-old actor who knew nothing of politics or the military. It demands a conclusion still further that the design must have originated in the minds of persons who were conversant with our Constitution and laws, men such as uh, Judah Benjamin, the Secretary of State and a lawyer, the Confederate Secretary of State, obviously, and a lawyer, Jefferson Davis, his superior, Alexander Stevens, the Vice President, James Seddon, the Secretary of War, and his successor, John Breckinridge, and Jacob Thompson, whom we've already met, the head of the Confederate Secret Service in Canada. And it demands a conclusion, finally, that the designers had the double purpose of first uh, exacting retribution against those whom they considered responsible for crushing their dream of independence, and second, snatching victory from the jaws of a toothless and chaotic government. I submit to you that there were many more people involved in the plot or the plots to decapitate the United States government and especially to assassinate uh, the president of the United States, Tim Booth, and his team. In his April 27, uh, 1865 statement, John Bingham, <coughs> uh, a judge advocate who questioned Harold, said that Harold uh, had told him that there were that Booth had said there were 35 people involved in the conspiracy. Booth told Samuel Knapp Chester, that man, his actor friend from New York, whom he tried to recruit in his conspiracy, that there were between 50 and 100 involved in the conspiracy. John Surratt told uh, Henri Beaumont, there's John Surratt, told uh, Henri Beaumont St. Marie in Italy, uh, in 1866, that he and Booth had acted, quote, under the orders of men who are not yet known, some of whom are still in New York, others in London. And Powell, whom we've already met, Lewis Powell, one of the conspirators, told Major Thomas 
Eckert, that man, the Assistant Secretary of War, right under Stanton, following his arrest, he said, quote, all I can say about this is that you, meaning federal prosecutors, have not got the one half of them, unquote. Not got the one half? They had nine. Does that mean that there were at least 18 involved in the conspiracy? I submit to you that that's exactly what it means, and almost certainly more than 18. Further, after his arrest, Powell told the Reverend, Abram, Reverend Dr. Abram Dunn Gillette, his spiritual counselor, on the night preceding his hanging, he said that he did not know the names of the principal men collaborating with Booth, clearly indicating and revealing that there were such outside of Booth's immediate action team. Still further, Powell told Eckert that it was his impression, that was the word he used, it was imp his impression that arrangements had been made for the same disposition of other federal office holders as he was to make of Seward. And still further, Powell constantly affirmed that he was working under the orders of Confederate authorities. Indeed, he repeated that fact on the day of his execution. And still further, Dr. Samuel Mudd, <coughs> that fellow, when he was at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas, he was spared the noose. He wrote home to his wife, Frankie, and asked tellingly if there had been any additional arrests. And still further, Thomas Jones, whom we've already met, the self-described head of the Confederate Secret Service in Maryland, who helped Booth and Harold escape when they were fugitives, later wrote that he was surprised, he said, that the revenge taken by the United States government for Abraham Lincoln's death stopped where it did. Now, time precludes my mentioning more than a few of the others, but I will mention a few. Thomas? Harbin, Thomas H. Harbin, a top Confederate agent who was very close to Booth. Uh, both, he met with Booth both before and after the assassination. He was named by Atzerat in one of Atzerat's many confessions as being a party to the conspiracy. More about him later. There are those who helped Booth and Harold escape in Maryland and Virginia, the so-called mail line between Richmond and Washington, including Samuel Cox, that man, Thomas Jones, whom we've already met twice, Elizabeth, there is Jones, Elizabeth Cuisenberry, William Bryant, Joseph Baden, and John Hughes. Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow, another top Confederate agent who wrote in 1880, 15 years after the assassination, he wrote about a secret mission he had undertaken in Washington in March of 65, that was one month before the assassination, at the behest of Jefferson Davis. He told of being, quote, in constant communication with an officer occupying an important position about Mr. Lincoln. And he added that he had made that officer a proposition. Significantly, after the assassination, he left the country for Canada in the summer of 65, did not return to Virginia for two years, 1867. George Nicholas Sanders, a Komodo dragon and a leading light in the Confederate and uh, the Canadian contingent of the Secret Service, of the Confederate Secret Service. He had a long history of organizing assassination plots uh, against those whom he considered despots. He confided in one Colonel Ambrose Stevens, a Union spy, his plan to assassinate Lincoln. Richard M. Smoot, we met him once before, a Confederate agent, and his co-conspirators Eli Hunt on the upper right, and Frederick Stone on the lower right, <clears throat> all named by Smoot in a 1900 writing as 35 years after the event as being involved in the plot against Lincoln. 
General George McClellan, we all know him, uh, and uh, August Belmont, the New York millionaire, Fernando Wood, the mayor of New York, and Charles A. Haswell, a ship designer and secessionist, and Jeremiah LaRoque, uh, the law partner of Copperhead Samuel Barlow, all very wealthy and powerful Copperheads, uh, all of whom met in Belmont's Fifth Avenue mansion in New York, at least once that we know of, November 64. And we may be certain if they met once, they met more than once. Well, about this time, some of you may be saying, well, so what? So five of the richest, most powerful copperheads meet at Belmont's Fifth Avenue mansion in New York? So what? Well, so nothing. Except for one thing. There was a sixth attendee at that meeting that we know of, but he was not a copperhead. He was a Marylander, known to have strong Southern sympathies. And his name was John Wilkes Booth. So, creation of chaos in the government was the main motive for multiple assassinations. There were others, but time precludes my naming more than a few. Retribution for ringing the curtain of history down on their peculiar institution and crushing their dream of independence. Retribution for the Isaac Wistar raid, <coughs> excuse me, on Richmond on February 6, 1864, and Wistar's orders, which provided for the capture of Jefferson Davis and his cabinet. More importantly, retribution for the Dahlgren Kilpatrick raid on Richmond, which took place on February 28th to March 2nd, 1864, and the orders that were found on Dahlgren's corpse, uh, namely, not that Jefferson Davis and his cabinet were to be captured, but that they were to be killed. Though, uh, uh, there is Kilpatrick. That was Ulrich Dahlgren, incidentally. He was killed in the raid. Kilpatrick survived. Kilpatrick, though quite possibly a forgery, at least in part, James M. McPherson, the foremost uh, Civil War scholar in the United States today, deems the Dahlgren Papers, and that's how they are referred to, the Dahlgren Papers, deems their authenticity to be, quote, contestable. But what is more important is that the orders were accepted as genuine by the Confederate leadership, as bona fide by the Confederate government and by the Southern people and press and gave rise to calls for retribution in kind. Both raids, it was said, had, had to have Lincoln's approval. It is absolutely certain that they did, but it is equally certain that the offensive orders, if genuine, did not come from Lincoln, but from Stanton. The historians James O. Hall, the grandfather of assassination historians, and Eric Wittenberg, who studied the authenticity of the Dahlgren papers in great depth, concluded that they are in fact genuine, but they didn't come from Lincoln, but from Stanton. Four, retribution for failure of three peace initiatives. One at Niagara Falls, one at Richmond, one at Hampton Roads, all laid at Lincoln's feet because he stood like granite on the issues of union and emancipation. And lastly, retribution for the hanging of that man, John Yates Bell. He was from a prominent Virginia family and might even have been a cousin of Booth. There's some evidence of that effect, but it isn't strong. He was executed for acts of terrorism despite efforts of many prominent men and women, north and south, in and out of government to save him. His execution left a bitter taste in the mouths of Confederate leaders who knew that this prominent Virginian went to his death following their orders and instructions. The terror campaign. 
The attempted decapitation of the United States government was the crown jewel in a campaign of terror against the North in the last year of the war, that is to say from the spring of 64 to the spring of 65. <clears throat> Again, time precludes my naming more than a few of the acts of terror. The boat burners. The boat burners were an arm of the Confederate Torpedo Bureau in the Confederate Secret Service. They blew up more than 60 Union gunboats on the Mississippi and other inland waterways, costing the Union thousands of lives and millions of dollars using coal and log bombs, which are just what the word said. A bomb fashioned to look like a lump of coal or a log put in a tender, which is then shoveled into a boiler with the intended effect. The boat burners were under the command of J.W. Uh, Tucker, the man on the left, and the Torpedo Bureau was under the command of Gabriel J. Rains, the man on the right. Arsonists, under the command of that fellow, Robert Cobb Kennedy, set fire to dozens of hotels, theaters, and shopping facilities in New York City on the night of November 25th, 1864. From Toronto, uh, Jacob Thompson, orchestrated an attempt to foment a second civil war by, in the north, thereby uh, uh, splitting the east from the west and establishing what was referred to as the Northwest Confederacy. Orders for the Northwest con uh, Conspiracy came from Davis, Benjamin, Seton, and Thompson to this man, Captain Thomas Henry Hines. He was the principal player. Part of Seddon's orders to Hines were given verbally, and only verbally. It does not require a particularly vivid imagination to imagine why. Hines had previously outlined his plans to Seddon, the Secretary of War, to seize the governments of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and to assassinate the executive heads of those states, John Bruff of Ohio, Oliver P. Morton, of Indiana and Richard Yates of Illinois and all other federal, state, and even municipal leaders who stood in the way of capturing control of those three states. Let's think about that for a minute. If the Confederate government was ready and willing in the summer of 64 to assassinate governors of three states whose contribution to their losses was modest, and when the Confederacy was still in the game, albeit not by much, would they hesitate in the spring of 65 to assassinate the leaders of the federal government whose contributions to their losses was much greater? <clears throat> and when the Confederacy was on its last legs, its resources all but exhausted. There was a scheme masterminded by that fellow Dr. Luke P. Blackburn of Kentucky, the Joseph Mengele of his day, to spread yellow fever in the North using infected clothing that he had obtained in Bermuda, where there had been an epidemic. Part of the scheme involved sending infected shirts to the White House as an in a gift from an anonymous benefactor. Infected in quotes. They didn't know that you couldn't spread yellow fever that way. It would take another 35 years before Dr. Walter Reed would find out the real way that yellow fever was spread. Anyway, the purpose of the shirts, obviously, was to assassinate Lincoln. The scheme was revealed by one Godfrey Hyams at the trial of the conspirators. Hyams, a shoemaker, was enlisted by Blackburn and other Confederate agents to sell or distribute the, quote, infected clothing. And what is most interesting about this scheme is that after the Wistar Dahlgren Kilpatrick raids in February and March of 64, a series of high-level meetings were held in Richmond uh, by officials of the Confederate government and the Secret Service and the Confederate military for the purpose of deciding appropriate responses to the raids. Following these meetings, and as a consequence of them, Davis directed Clement C. Clay, that man, 
from Alabama, and uh, Jacob Thompson, whom we've already met like three times, <coughs> there he is again, to go to Montreal carrying drafts of one million in gold, that's 2.2 million in greenbacks, with only verbal orders, only verbal orders and instructions, observe that the orders and instructions were so sensitive that they could not be committed to paper even in code. Again, it does not require a particularly vivid imagination to surmise why. They must have been odious in the extreme. The kind of orders that must never see the light of day. The kind of orders that called for political assassinations and death of innocence on a massive scale, which, as we have already seen and we'll see later, they did. They joined James P. Holcomb, that fellow of Virginia, whom Davis had sent there in February, also with verbal orders. And what followed was a campaign of terror against the North from the spring of 64, as I said, to the spring of 65. Part of the campaign was the yellow fever plot that I just described. Hyams testified that he met regularly with these three men and Blackburn, uh, who counseled him with respect to the sale and distribution of the infected, quote, infected clothing. They promised him $100,000, that's a million and a half in today's money, for his services, and they even said perhaps 10 times that amount. And they also promised him, and this is really significant, another reward, namely that he would become, quote, a gentleman for the future instead of a working man and a mechanic. And they also told him that the Confederate government had appropriated $200,000, that's three million in today's money, to carry out the scheme. Now, lest anyone suppose that all of this was going on without Davis's knowledge and approval, there is a letter to him that survived the flames from Episcopalian minister, that man, a turned Confederate agent, Kenzie John Stewart, in which Stewart pleaded with Davis to desist from the yellow fever plot because he said he could not possibly find favor with God. And the letter expressly mentions Hyams. And the interesting thing, thing about it is that it did not dissuade Davis because four months later, the trunks were still full and the plot was still on, according to Hyams. So what does all this mean? In my judgment, it is proof positive, not evidence, but proof positive that as early as the summer of 64, the Confederate government and its Secret Service Bureau were actively plotting the murder of Abraham Lincoln because of the perceived license granted by the raids. It also is most probative of a conclusion that all attempts subsequent to the Wistar, Dogger, and Kilpatrick raids were related to them, including the shot that was taken at Lincoln when he was riding a horse alone towards the soldier's home in August of 64, and including, of course, the attempt that succeeded in April of 65. Let us make no mistake about this. This is critical. These three men, Holcomb, Clay, and Thompson, and Blackburn, were Davis's men. They were appointees of Davis, sent to Montreal by Davis to carry out verbal orders and instructions from Davis. They were financed by Davis. They were subject to recall by Davis and they were the same men who counseled Hyams as to how to spread pestilence in the North and to assassinate Lincoln by infecting him with yellow fever. This entire episode constitutes, in my judgment, a smoking gun. It demonstrates the, Confederacy gov the, Confederacy, uh, the Confederate government's intention to murder Abraham Lincoln as early as the summer of 64 and also Davis's willingness uh, to... Uh, to uh, take innocent life. I asked Joan Cashin, or Cashin, she was the biographer of Verena Davis. Verena was uh, Jefferson Davis's wife. I asked her uh, if based on her intimate knowledge of Jefferson Davis, if he were capable of taking so much innocent life to further the cause of Southern independence. Without hesitation, she said yes. So, let us state the matter clearly. None of these activities, and many more, 
that I haven't time to discuss, such as blowing up or poisoning the Cro Croton Reservoir, which was New York City's uh, uh, water supply, could possibly have been carried out without the knowledge and approval of and control by the highest levels of the Confederate government. Why should it be any different with respect to the crown jewel of the terror campaign, namely multiple assassinations? Let's talk about evidence. Atzerodt's confession. In, uh, in 1977, a lost confession of George Atzerodt was found. In part, this is what it said, quote, Booth said he had met a party in New York who would get the president certain. They were going to mine the end of the president's house near the War Department. They knew an entrance to, uh, to accomplish it through. Spoke about getting friends of the president to get up in entertainment, and they would mix it in and have a serenade and let's get at the president and party. These were understood to be projects. Booth said if he did not get them quick, the New York crowd would. Okay, because neither the New York crowd, uh, I'm sorry, Atzerodt's confession is corroborated by the fact that on April 3rd, the day Richmond was occupied, a Confederate soldier by the name of William H. Snyder, uh, an employee of the Torpedo Bureau of the Secret Service, made contact with Colonel Edward H. Ripley of the 9th Vermont Infantry, who was the commander of the occupying forces. Snyder told Ripley that a few days earlier, a party had been sent north by the Bureau, whose mission he understood to be probably the murder of Lincoln. Uh, Ripley published this in a memoir in 1907, in which he recorded the, the event. Because neither the New York crowd nor Booth had an explosives expert, the job of blowing up the White House was given to one Thomas F. Harney, an explosives expert with the Torpedo Bureau. He was part of a force that left Richmond on April 1st, at some point, he was joined by 150 cavalrymen uh, detached from Mosby's Rangers to facilitate entry into the city of Washington and their exit therefrom after the deed was done. As Harney and his force neared Washington, however, a unit of Illinois cavalry intercepted and captured uh, uh, um, Harney and his closest associates. One of Mosby's veterans described Harney's loss as, quote, irretrievable, unquote. In addition to the Booth's Rot plot, the New York crowd's plot, and the plot described by Atzeron and his lost, conf uh, his lost confession, as corroborated by Snyder and Ripley, there was another conspiracy in Washington, according to John Surratt, which is described in a lecture he gave in Rockville, Maryland, on uh, December 6, 1870. He said, quote, I had good reason to believe that there was another conspiracy afloat in Washington. In fact, we all knew it. Let's talk about John Wilkes Booth for a minute. We, we know that he was an agent of the Confederate Secret Service uh, because his sister Asia said so. In a memoir, this is sister, Asia. Uh, we also know that he spent 10 days in Montreal in the latter part of 64, from October 18th through October 27th inclusive. Let us then consider the terms, items rather, that tend to show that he was part of a major conspiracy to, to decapitate the government, as opposed to a loose cannon who worked for nine months to kidnap Lincoln and then change his mind at the last minute, and without orders uh, decided to kill the president. And while he was at it, to kill Johnson, Seward, Stanton, Grant, and perhaps others. <clears throat> Let us observe that Secret Service agents are trained above all to follow orders, never act without orders or contrary to orders, never reveal contacts, especially of superiors. And uh, uh, the idea that this particular Secret Service agent would strike out on his own and attempt to decapitate the United States government with incalculable military and political consequences, without orders or contrary to orders, is patently ridiculous. 
<clears throat> there is a letter in existence that came into the possession of the Bureau of Military Justice. It is dated May 10, 65, from a Union agent in Paris. This is uh, approximately a month after the assassination, <clears throat> in which the uh, writer, the Union agent, reported uh, that he intercepted a letter from a Confederate agent. Uh, identified uh, by the obvious alias of Johnston. In the, the Confederate agent's letter, <clears throat> he said, quote, Booth will never be taken. He will bullet himself first, thus evidencing intimate knowledge of Booth by the Confederate underground. And incidentally, is suicide in preference to surrender? Does that suggest kidnapping or killing uh, to Johnston? Booth was obviously something more than a loose cannon. In the same letter, Johnston said he arrived in Washington at 5 p.m. on the 14th, the day of the assassination. <clears throat> and within half an hour, he said, he knew that, quote, an attack, unquote, was going to be made that night. Such information obviously could only have come from other Confederate agents. Now, if Booth were a loose cannon who had just changed his mind with that fact already be known to Johnston? Would they describe an assassination attempt by a loose cannon as, quote, an attack? Or would they reserve that terminology to describe a major undertaking by multiple assailants against multiple targets for the purpose of uh, altering the course of the war and exacting retributive justice? The answer is in the letter itself, where it says, uh, if everything had gone according to plan, 15 Yankees would be dead, not one. The exact language is, quote, had it, the attack, been carried out as was arranged previously, some 15 of the Yankee leaders would have been now quietly resting where they should have gone some four years ago. Recall, too, that the conventional wisdom that Booth decided to kill and made his arrangements to kill took place at the 8 p.m. Herndon House meeting. Yet Johnston knew everything by 5.30. He knew everything because the plans for the assassination and the attempted assassinations had been laid long before the 8 p.m. Herndon House meeting and laid by many others besides Booth and his action team. Otherwise, no one but Booth would have known, known about it. The letter is extremely telling. It practically makes the case by itself. Its authenticity has never been questioned. In a letter dated April 10, 65, this is only four days before the assassination, an address to Booth at the National Hotel in Washington, uh, where he always stayed when he was in Washington, it is signed TIOS. The writer spoke of, quote, the four assassinations whose purpose was to avenge our wrongs, unquote and said that there was one assassin assigned for each member of Lincoln's cabinet. If we ought to understand what happened on April 14th, it is critically important that we realize that at no time during the period leading up to the assassination of Lincoln was Booth ever a rogue agent or a loose cannon, and that conversely at all times, he and his action team and their conspiracy were known ipso facto by the Confederate leadership. How could it be otherwise? Booth had rubbed elbows with dozens of Confederate Secret Service agents, including meetings in New Orleans with George Miller and Hiram Martin in the spring of 64, meetings with four Confederate agents at the Parker House Hotel in Boston in July of 64, meetings with the Conf uh, Canadian Cabinet in March and April of 64, and especially the one I already mentioned from October 18th to October 27th of 64. Further. Booth was known to be very close to Thomas Harbin. He met with him before the assassination. He met with him after the assassination. Harbin helped Booth and Harold escape to Maryland. <clears throat> after the war, Harbin left the country for five years. And then he wrote, when he returned, he wrote of his exploits as a Secret Service agent. And among other things, he said he, he reported directly to Davis. Further. Booth's right hand was known to be John Surratt, who was in constant contact with Judah Benjamin. <clears throat> and according to Lewis Weichmann, 
that's the border in Mrs. Surratt's boarding house, with Davis himself in Richmond. Okay. According to Henri Beaumont St. Marie, whom I've already spoken of, more about him later, Surratt said uh, that he went to Richmond every week, every week to meet with Judah Benjamin, the Secretary of State. Eli Evans, Benjamin's biographer, stated categorically that Surratt's was Benjamin's most trusted courier. So John Surratt is John Wilkes Booth's right hand, and he's meeting weekly with the Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary of State, of the Confederacy Secretary of State in Richmond. So let us reason together. If Booth is in constant contact with Harbin, and Harbin is reporting directly to Davis, and if Booth's right hand, John Surratt, is in constant contact with Judah Benjamin, the Confederate Secretary of State, and according to Weichmann with Davis himself, then how could Benjamin and Davis not know about Booth and his team and what they were doing and what they were not doing? Davis's and Benjamin's knowledge of Booth and his team and their conspiracy is therefore absolutely certain. Let us again reason together. We have a three-premise syllogism. Confederate leaders knew about Booth's conspiracy. Confederate leaders knew kidnapping would do them no good at all. And Confederate leaders did nothing to stop Booth. I submit that one and only one conclusion can be drawn from this three-premise syllogism. And it is that Booth's purpose was not kidnapping and that Confederate leaders knew it. Well, if it was not kidnapping, then what was it? For what purpose did Confederate Secret Service operatives meet, counsel, encourage, and finance Booth? The answer is that they met, counseled, encouraged, and financed him to kill, not to kidnap. Eminent assassination historian Theodore Roscoe agrees. He said, quote, it is highly unlikely that the stage star, for all his flamboyance, would risk such a desperate undertaking without the assurance of underground support and the approval of Richmond. Finance, did I, did I say finance? Let me tell you how the Confederate government and or its supporters financed Booth. Surratt told Dr. Lewis J. A. McMillan, his traveling companion aboard the Peruvian on their way to Europe in September of 65, that he and Booth had spent $10,000 on their conspiracy. That's $150,000 in today's money. Where on earth did this son of a boarding house keeper and his unemployed actor friend get $150,000, if not from the Confederate government, and or its supporters. Booth told Chester, his actor friend from New York, whom we met, that he was low on funds and that he or another party had to go to Richmond to obtain the means to carry out their designs. Arnold uh, spoke of Booth's many trips to New York to obtain money. Powell told uh, his spiritual counselor, Gillette, immediately preceding his execution, that for months uh, previous to the assassination, he had journeyed back and forth between Richmond and Washington and Baltimore, stayed in palatial homes of prominent men who kept him in funds, whose funds, uh, and with these funds, he came and went at their bidding. Atzerodt and Herald were seen to be flashing rolls of bills in bars and restaurants. Arnold and Lachlan were said to never lack for money, to have plenty of money, including gold. Atzerodt is reported to have said that he, with others, was engaged in an enterprise that would make him rich or get, hung on the, or get him hung on the spot if detected. To John Greenewalt, the keeper of the Pennsylvania House, that cheap Washington hotel I mentioned, Atzerodt said, I'm going away one of these days, and, uh, but I will return with as much gold as will keep me all my lifetime. Harold told friends in Port Tobacco three weeks before the assassination that the next time they heard from him, he'd be in Spain, that he would have a barrel of money, he'd be rich enough to buy Port Tobacco. He told Special Judge Advocate John A. Bingham, his interrogator, that Booth recruited him to, quote, make money. Weichmann, the border, <clears throat> he, uh, he spoke of an opportunity to join an enterprise that, quote, would make a lot of money, 20 or 30,000 or something, that's 300,000 
to 450,000 in today's money. And lastly, Sam Arnold said that the men by whom Booth had been surrounded and who had associated themselves with him were to a great extent ignorant men. They clung to him for the bounty they were receiving at his hand. Money, money, money. Where is all this money coming from? Which is the more reasonable conclusion? That it was coming from Booth, who had no assets left in his name, having turned everything over to his mother and his older brother, Junius, because of the treason statute, which provided that the funds of traitors would be confiscated, or that it was coming from the Confederate government and or its supporters. Clearly, the latter, quote, where else, asked James O. Hall rhetorically in his fine little booklet titled To Make a Fortune, John Wilkes Booth Following the Money Trail. <coughs> I don't have, we have a tech person here. We, we, we ran out of, we ran out of, uh, let's see what happened here. We ran out of Jews. <laughs> we had a few pictures left. Yeah, I think they announced that they were going to turn the Wi-Fi off at a certain oh, time. Oh, yeah, at a quarter till. Oh, okay. All right, well, we had a few left. We'll do without them. All right, let's talk about John Surratt. We've already met John Surratt, alias John Harrison, John McCarty, John Watson, many other aliases. We know with absolute certainty that he was an agent of the Confederate Secret Service from at, at least July 63. We also know that he was in constant and direct contact with Booth in Washington and with Judah Benjamin, and according to Weichmann, with Jefferson Davis himself in Richmond. He was the principal go-between. As the boarder in Mrs. Surratt's boarding house, he was privy to information that came from conversations between Booth and Mary Surratt, John Surratt's mother. We also know that he traveled to Richmond in, uh, March of tw uh, uh, on March 29th of 65 with Sarah Slater, a top Confederate courier. He met with Benjamin and Davis. He returned to Washington on April 3rd with substantial sums of money and dispatches for the Canadian cabinet. He left for Montreal the following morning. He stopped in New York to see Booth. He was advised that Booth wasn't there. He was in Washington. I'm sorry, he was in Boston for an engagement while he was in Montreal. And this is critical. He received a telegram from Booth on April 10th. That's Monday of the week of the assassination, which occurred on Friday. Booth instructed him to return forthwith to Washington because, quote, their plans had changed, unquote. Plans had changed? Well, who or what changed them? Does this not strongly suggest Outside direction, a change in circumstances, such as the capture of Thomas Harney on the 9th. That'll change plans. After the assassination, he fled to Canada, then to England, then to France, then to Switzerland, then to Italy, where he joined the papal zouaves. And what was he fleeing from? Does an innocent man flee? He later said that his mother was completely innocent. Does an innocent man flee and leave his completely innocent mother to the hangman? As for St. Marie, he too joined the papal zouaves. He recognized Surratt, now using the alias John Watson. The two had attended St. Charles Academy in Baltimore three years earlier. After many conversations, he prepared an affidavit, St. Marie did, uh, dated July 10th at 66, and addressed to the Honorable William H. Seward, the United States Secretary of State. In pertinent part, this is what it said. I, Henri de Saint Marie, have met Surratt here in Italy in a small town called Velletri. He is now known under the name of John Watson. I recognized him before he made himself known to me and told him privately, you are John Surratt, the person I have known in Maryland. He acknowledged that he was and begged uh, of me to keep the thing secret. After some conversation, we spoke of the unfortunate affair of the assassination of President Lincoln. And these are his words, quote, damn the Yankees, they have killed my mother, but I have done them as much harm as I could. We have killed Lincoln, the nigger's friend. 
He then said he was in the Secret Service of the South. Speaking of the murder, he said they had acted under the orders of men who were not yet known, some of whom are still in New York and others in London. I am aware that money is sent him yet from London. He says he can get money in Rome at any time. I have also asked him if he knew Jefferson Davis. He said no, but that he had acted under the instructions of persons under his immediate orders. Being asked if Jefferson Davis had anything to do with the assassination, he said, I am not going to tell you. My impression is that he brought the order from Richmond, as he was in the habit of going there weekly. This is the exact truth of what I know about Surratt. More I could not learn being afraid to awaken his suspicions. Another smoking gun? Yes. Why? Because saying, I am not going to tell you, in response to the question, was Davis involved, is as good as an affirmative answer. Because it means that Surratt knows. Otherwise, you would have said, I don't know. You're asking the wrong guy. And Davis was complicit. Uh, otherwise, he would have said, Davis, no, Davis, he's completely innocent. He had nothing to do with it. I am not going to tell you, therefore, fits only with Davis's complicity and Surratt's knowledge of it. Judah Benjamin, the Secretary of State, on the day preceding the evacuation of Richmond, that was uh, the 2nd of April, 65, he burned all his, almost all, his correspondence and records, and then he set out with Davis and other members of the rump government southward. When he passed the Savannah River, he destroyed the rest of his correspondence and records, and then began an incredibly harrowing journey to, quote, get to the farthest place from the United States if it takes me to the middle of China, unquote. Despite swarms of insects, federal patrols, heat, hunger, thirst, shipwrecks, fires at sea, and other near misses with death, he made it to England, where he carved out a successful career as a barrister and then died a natural death in 1884 at the age of 72 in Paris, where he is buried. For the remainder of his life, he never spoke of the American Civil War. And unlike many, many others, thousands of others, he never returned to the United States. And I know why. Because he was up to his eyeballs in terror and assassination plots and knew he would not escape the, hang, the hangman. Jefferson Davis, when Davis was read a telegram in Charlotte, North Carolina on the 19th of April, that is um, five days after the assassination, advising him uh, of the assassination, uh, a witness said that his eyes brightened, uh, evidencing pleasure. And then he said, uh, taking a line from Macbeth, he said, uh, Quote, well, if it were to be done, it were better that it were well done. A day or two later, in uh, a response to Breckenridge's expression of regret, saying that he thought the assassination would hurt the South, Davis said, well, General, I don't know. If it were to be done, it were better that it were well done. And if the same had been done to Andy Johnson, the beast, and to Secretary of War Stanton, the job would be complete. Quote, unquote. Louis Bates, Davis's host, who was with him at the time, testified at the trial of the conspirators that these were his exact words. And uh, four witnesses affirmed Bates's reputation for truth and veracity, and one affirmed the receipt of the telegram. Do these sound like the words of an innocent man? A man who genuinely regretted the murder of his political counterpart? Or do they sound like a man who was secretly pleased by that result? and uh, whose only regret was that others had met the same fate. I submit the latter, and I submit that these words spoken in an unguarded moment are probative of his complicity. We're getting near the end. In February of 65, the Confederacy changed its enciphering key from complete victory to come retribution. What does that tell us? It tells us two things. It tells us that the highest levels of the Confederate government realized that there wasn't going to be any victory. And they had resolved to seek revenge against the Northern leadership for crushing their dream of independence. But it tells us something else. It tells us that the Confederate government knew that it was capable of an exacting retribution 
It would not threaten something if it could not execute. But how exactly was the retribution to be accomplished? With their armies melting away, what form would it take? The answer, obviously, is multiple assassinations, because nothing else would constitute true retribution and revenge. The Batwell Report, a House committee known as the Committee on the Judiciary of the House of Representatives, uh, conducted an inquiry into the nature of the evidence implicating Jefferson Davis and other Southern, Southern leaders in the assassination. The report was known as the Boutwell Report, after George uh, S. Boutwell, who was chairman of the committee. Using only testimony known to be untainted by perjury, they concluded that there was, quote, probable cause to link Jefferson Davis and the other Confederate leaders to the conspiracy. It is worth mentioning that they were 157 years closer to the event than we are. William A. Tidwell's conclusion. Permit me to quote an expert, William A. Tidwell. He spent his entire life in uh, government intelligence, United States government intelligence, and he wrote two books on the Lincoln assassination. Uh, he wrote uh, Conretribution with James O. Hall and David Gaddy, and April 65, a solo. In all three, all three incidentally are sadly deceased. Uh, in April 65, he wrote, quote, what has been established, however, is a network of documented facts that logically coincide with the information that would have had to exist if Davis did decide to attack the leaders of the federal government. One can refute the logic only by a bizarre distortion of reason. The probability that all of these facts were true and that Davis did not make the critical decision is very slight indeed. And now I'm going to tell you what my conclusion is. Uh, it's very brief, and then I'm done. My conclusion. The grunts and the hatchet men went to the gallows and the dry tortugas. But their masterminds walked. When, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you when has it ever been otherwise? Thank you very much. Uh, as, you, <clears throat> as you've already been advised, I, I took five years out of my life to read all or part of 125 books on the assassination. And uh, plus a lot of other things, you know, newspapers, uh, magazines, articles, you name it. And uh, I uh, was successful in having the book published. It's titled uh, Decapitating the Union, Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin, and the Plot to Assassinate Lincoln. And it sells for $25 at Amazon and other online booksellers and in all bookstores. And, uh, but incident to these PowerPoint presentations, I always take 20% off, so if you want, Want the book? It's back. I have copies back there for twenty dollars, and I'd be happy to sign it for you. And please, don't do what one woman did. I said, "Oh, she bought the book." And I said, "Well, that's very nice of you. I'd be happy to sign it for." Her. I don't want you to sign it. <laughs> I don't know. To this day, I don't know why she didn't want me to sign it, but it was just one of those things. Okay. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat>